Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at some questions based on magnetic fields and also electromagnetic induction. Uh, so we'll start off with some electromagnetic induction. So we've got a transformer uh, and the secondary side of the transformer we see passes through a diode, we've got a resistor there and we've got connections T1 and T2 and we're looking at using it to charge a 12 volt battery. So the transformer produces an output of 15 volts across the secondary coil. It would have to be bigger than 12 to enable it to charge a 12 volt battery. Calculate a suitable turns ratio for the transformer. Okay, so on the primary side we've got 240 volts and on the secondary side we output 15 volts so we can see we've got a 16 to 1 voltage ratio and therefore we'd need a 16 to 1 turns ratio as well okay so we've got the output and we could because we've got an ac input we get an ac output as well okay so on the same axis, sketch the graph of the potential difference across terminals T1 and T2 before the battery is connected. So the key to drawing this is the fact that there's a diode in the circuit which rectifies the AC. So it's going to cut off any of the negative section of potential difference. So we'd still get the peaks, but we then would have flats whenever it's negative. So it says explain how we're actually doing this. So the key is the fact that the diode only conducts in one direction and so it only conducts when the potential difference is positive. Um, we could have done this entire question the other way around. I guess we could have had only the negative section of the potential difference graph and said it only conducts when the potential difference is negative. That's fine too, um, but that's the key idea anyway. Okay, so on the diagram, draw a, in a battery connected so that it may be charged. Okay, so the key to this is getting the direction right. So when a battery is discharging, the current comes out of the long side. So when it's charging, the current must be going into the long side. And so it must be coming through the diode and into the long side. So that's how we know it's that way around. So when fully charged, the 12 volt battery can supply a current of 2 amps for 30 hours. Calculate the battery power when supplying a current of 2 amps. Uh, the battery power is just going to be doing P equals IV, uh, so we're going to get 24 watts. Then we want the energy supplied. Well, we need the time to be in seconds in order to use the equation E equals PT. Uh, we've already calculated power previously. Multiply by time gives us the energy in joules. So the diagram shows three resistors connected across a low voltage DC supply and a CRO as a way of displaying the waveform. Okay. Explain how you would use a one volt DC supply to calibrate the CRO. Okay, so what we, the first thing I do is see where the initial position of the marker is in the CRO. Essentially, there'll be a light blob to show where it initially is. Then what you do is you apply the one volt supply to the Y inputs that you can see there. And what we're looking for is seeing how many divisions the reading has increased. That will tell us what the scale is on the system. Okay, so drawing the connections between the CRO and the circuit so the potential difference between the points C and D may be measured. Uh, so essentially what we need to do is connect one to each of the inputs and then what it'll do is it'll measure the difference between those two. The potential difference between A and F, B and C, C and D and D and E are all measured. State the relationship between them. Uh, so it's going to be the EMF supplied, which is what we're going to measure between AMF, will be equal to the sum of all of the other potential differences because they're all in series with one another. Okay, so moving on to have a look at an electromagnet. Um, so we're using an electromagnet to make a permanent magnet. And uh, we've got a coil made of thick copper wire and we've got a cardboard tube to make sure it doesn't come into contact with the thing we're trying to magnetize. So two bars of the same size are also available, one made of iron, the other made of steel. State which bar would be used to make a permanent magnet. Well, we need a hard magnetic material to make a permanent magnet, so we're going to need steel. Describe how the apparatus would be used to make a permanent magnet. So what you do 
is you insert the steel bar into the coil. You switch on the DC supply, and it does have to be DC to make a permanent magnet, and you leave it for a period of time because steel is a hard magnetic material. It will take quite a bit of work in order to get all the magnetic domains aligned, so we need to allow uh, a period of time for that work to be done. Suggest one reason why the circuit contains an ammeter and a variable resistor. So ammeter, so we can measure, measure the current, monitor it, make sure there's no issues. And we want a variable resistor to keep the current low to prevent overheating. So the variable resistor would allow us to adjust what the current is in the circuit. During the making of a permanent magnet, the ammeter reads a steady current of 4 amps throughout the 5 seconds that the current is switched on. The voltage supply is 12 volts. Calculate the total resistance. Uh, so resistance is potential difference divided by current. So that gives us a current of 3 ohms. Power. Uh, well, power is current times potential difference. So that's a fairly straightforward calculation as well. 48 watts. And then energy supplied. Again, using E equals PT, we've got time already in seconds, so we don't need to make a conversion, gives us the energy. The potential difference across a variable resistor is 7 volts, and that across the ammeter is 0. Calculate the potential difference across the magnetizing coil. Okay, so uh, if we're supplying an EMF of 12, that's the total amount we're putting in. If we're taking 7 volts across the variable resistor, that leaves 5 to be across the magnetizing coil, because the 5 and the 7 need to add together to give us 12. So state the general principle used in this calculation. Well, in a closed loop in a circuit, some of the EMFs, i.e. the energy supplied to each charge by the power source, must be equal to the sum of the potential differences, the energy taken out of each charge by the components. So the diagram shows a long straight wire between the poles of a permanent magnet, and we can see that it's marked with an X, so that shows us we've got a current going into the page. It's connected through a switch to a battery so that when the switch is closed, there is a steady current. So we're going to get a DC current. Say the direction of the magnetic field between the poles of the magnet. Well, the field goes from the north pole to the south pole, uh, or from left to right, if you want to describe it like that. The wire is free to move. The current is switched on so that its direction is into the page. State the direction of movement of the wire. So if we go back to the diagram, I've put the field lines on here, and we're told the current goes into the page. So my middle finger of my left hand is pointing into the page. My first finger is pointing across to the right. So my thumb is pointing down the page. That would be the direction of the force, and therefore the acceleration of the wire. Okay, so the wire will move vertically down, and it's going to be perpendicular to both the current and the magnetic field, as it always is. Explain how you reached your answer to B. So you heard me using Fleming's left-hand rule. So that was the law I was using. Uh, my first finger points from left to right, because it goes from north to south. Middle finger points into the page, because that's the current. And my thumb, or the force, points downwards. Uh, you could also have done this question by drawing a diagram showing how the two fields interact and showing the force goes from high flux density to low. That would work as well, uh, but this is actually how I did it. This experiment is the basis of an electric motor. Describe two changes to the arrangement shown in the diagram that would enable continuous ro rotation to take place. Um, so we could use a coil mounted on an axle instead of a single wire. Um, because if we want to get rotation, we need it in a coil, not just a wire. And we'd also need to the a split ring commutator and brushes set up uh, to allow it to continue rotating in the same direction. So those are the two things we would need. A transformer has an output of 24 volts when supplying a current of 2 amps. Okay, The current in the primary coil is 0.40 amps and the transformer is 100% efficient. Calculate the power output. So if it's 100% efficient, uh, the power input is equal to the power output. So the power output is equal to uh, IV, so 48 watts. Um, so the voltage applied to the primary coil, so power in equals power out. So we know that because we know the secondary current and voltage and the primary current, we can figure out what the primary voltage is um, there. 
explain what is meant by the statement that the transformer is 100% efficient. Uh, what it means is the power input into a transformer is equal to the power output, or we could say the energy input is equal to the energy output. The, they essentially mean the same thing. Um, and the reason we can say that is what we're saying is there's no energy wasted by a transformer, and actually transformers themselves are about 99% efficient usually. Uh, there's lots of things that are done to them that allows them to be incredibly efficient. So that's actually a pretty good approximation to make, generally speaking. So how the transformer changes an input voltage into an output voltage. So the first thing is we've got a changing magnetic field around the primary coil and that magnetizes the iron core. Okay. That's why we use iron, because it's soft, so it easily magnetizes. And the changing magnetic field around the iron core cuts through the secondary coil, and that's what induces your EMF, and if it's in a complete circuit, it can induce a current as well. So if we want to produce a different output voltage, what we need to do is change the number of secondary turns compared to the primary one, because that's how we change the EMF to something different. Okay, so we've got uh, a diagram showing the screen of a CRO, a cathode ray oscilloscope. Uh, this is something we use to display electrical signals or oscillating type motion usually. So the CRO is being used to display the output from a microphone. The vertical scale on the screen is in volts. Okay, so describe the output from the microphone. So the first thing I'm noticing is, is we've got a periodic signal, which means it's repeating itself. And it doesn't seem to be taking preset values, so I'd describe it as being a continuous or and we could call it an analog type signal if you like. But it's definitely periodic because we can see it repeating itself. Use the graph to determine the peak voltage of the output. Uh, so you're just reading off a graph here, you get 1.6 volts. Describe how you would check that the voltage calibration on the screen is correct. Uh, so what I would do is I'd connect a known voltage to the plates of the CRO. And it's, we always connect them to the Y plates because we're trying to uh, displace in the vertical or Y direction. And essentially the CRO reading should match with the known voltage reading. Okay, so the diagram shows the screen of a CRO when it's being used to measure a small time interval between two voltage pulses. What is the distance on the screen between the two voltage pulses? So this is actually a measurement I'm taking using a ruler, and I reckon it's 6.1 centimeters when I measured it. The time base control of the CRO is set at five milliseconds per centimeter. Calculate the time interval between the voltage pulses. Okay, so we've got 6.1 centimetres, 5 milliseconds per centimetre, that gives us a total of 31 milliseconds. So just one example where a CRO can be used to measure a small time interval. So we use CROs any time there's a very small difference between things. So it allows us to uh, have a, it's a very sensitive time measuring device. So any time we're timing things where things might happen in very quick succession. So the thing I would think of is sprinters finishing 100 meters. They can finish one hundredth of a second apart. So uh, it would be a classic example of that. So electromagnetic induction can be demonstrated using a solenoid, a magnet, a sensitive ammeter, and a connecting wire. In the space below, draw a labeled diagram of the apparatus set up to demonstrate electromagnetic induction. Okay, so what we need is we need a very sensitive ammeter, which we usually we call a galvanometer. And we need that connected to some kind of coil loop or solenoid if we're being fancy. And what we need is also is a bar magnet that we can move in and out of that coil. So we, you can see the equipment that we've got here. So state one way of using the apparatus to produce an induced current. Well, we need to move the magnet into the coil. We could also pull the magnet out of the coil. That would work too. But essentially, as long as the field lines of the magnet are cutting through the coil. So explain why your method produces an induced current. So the key thing is the magnetic field lines around the magnet cut through the conductor coils. That's going to induce an EMF and it's going to induce a current. So without changing the apparatus, state what must be done to produce an induced current in the opposite direction. But we need to move the magnet in the opposite direction. So in this case, out of the coil, because originally I moved it into the coil. And at a larger induced current, we'd move the magnet faster. 
Now for this question, we can't answer increase the number of coils because it says without changing the apparatus. So we have to go with move the magnet faster. So there we've got a diagram of a transformer. OK, and we've, we can see we've got two C cores connected together with clips uh, X and Y by the looks of it. So use the ideas of electromagnetic induction to explain how the input voltage is transformed into an output voltage. Use three questions below to help you with your answer. So what happens in the primary coil? Well, what we do is we have an AC supply and that sends an AC current or an alternating current, I should say, in the primary coil, which means there's a continuously varying magnetic field around the primary coil. Yeah, so that's our starting point. So this electromagnet essentially magnetizes the C core. So we've got the, the iron C cores that are in the middle. Their domains align with the primary field. And, it, and so it, it itself now has a magnetic field. And that field is what cuts through the secondary coil. So what happens in the secondary coil? Well, the, the cores constantly changing magnetic field cuts through the secondary coil and we get an EMF induced. And if it's in a complete circuit, we can induce a current too. State where it's needed to make the output voltage higher than the input voltage. Well, we need more turns on the secondary side than the primary side. The core of a transformer splits along x, x and y, y. Explain why the transformer would not work if the two halves of the core were separated by about 30 centimeters. So quite a distance apart now. So what's not going to happen now is the secondary side of the core is not going to be an electromagnet anymore because it's going to be outside the magnetic field of the primary coil. So it's not going to get magnetized. So there's going to be no magnetic field cutting through the secondary coil. So we're not going to get any EMF. OK, so 100 percent efficient transformer is used to step up the voltage for supply from 100 volts to 200 volts. A resistor is connected to the output and the current in the primary side is 0.4 amps. State the current in the secondary. So essentially, we're going to apply power in it equals power out. We want the secondary current or I2. So we rearrange, plug the numbers in and we can see we get 0.2. So we've got a sketch of an apparatus apparently found in the Science Museum, which is once used to show how electrical energy can be converted into kinetic energy. When the switch is closed, the wheel starts to turn. OK, so what we can see here is we, the current's going to come out of the supply once the switch is closed. It's going to go along the metal supports and it's going to go down through the spoke of the wheel into the small dish of mercury, which is connected back to the DC supply. So that's where our complete circuit is. So explain why the wheel turns when the switch is closed. So we now have a complete circuit, which means we've got a current flowing and a current has a magnetic field. So the field around the current, uh, current carrying spoke, if we like, interacts with the magnetic field and that produces a magnetic force, which exerts a turning effect on the wheel. So draw an arrow to show the direction of rotation of the wheel. So if we go back to this, we can see conventional current goes up out the power supply and it's going to go down the rod. So my middle finger is kind of pointing down in the same direction as the rod is. The field is going from north to south. So my thumb is sort of pointing diagonally downwards to the right uh, once I've got all these lined up. So what it's going to do is it's going to rotate around anti-clockwise. So we're going to get a rotation in this kind of direction, but I'm just using Fleming's left hand rule here. So a DC motor is another way to convert electrical energy into kinetic energy. Draw a labeled diagram of a DC motor. Uh, well, I, I've stolen one I found online, but I, we can show the key points. So we've got a coil of wire inside a magnetic field and we've got a commutator connected to the coil and we've got brushes connected to a circuit. And that's what gives us all the connections we need. So describe how the split ring commutator works on an electric motor. So the brushes stay fixed and they connect to the opposite side of the split ring commutator every 180 degrees of rotation. And that causes the current to reverse every time they change the connection. 
The diagram shows apparatus used to investigate electromagnetic effects around straight wires. So we've got a thin flexible wire, uh, a thick rigid vertical wire, uh, and the, the thick vertical wire is kind of tightly constrained by the looks of it. So we've got, we're now looking down on it, and we've got a battery connected for, to T1 and T2, so there's a current vertically down the thick wire. So draw field lines to indicate with arrows the direction of the three. So what I'm doing is I'm using the right hand corkscrew rule. So my thumb is going down into the page because the current is going down into the page and my fingers are showing the field goes clockwise around the wire. Um, the other thing I'm showing is the, wire, the field gets weaker as you move away from the wire, which is why the spacing is getting bigger. So using a variable resistor, the potential difference between terminals T1 and T2 is gradually reduced. State, if any, the effect this will have on the magnetic field. Strength, uh, well, it's going to get weaker. Um, so if you have a smaller potential difference, you're going to get a smaller current and it's going to give you a weaker field. But it's not going to change the direction of the field. The only way we can change the direction of the field is if we change the current direction. The battery is now connected to terminals T3 and T4, as well as T1 and T2, so there's now a current down both wires. This causes the flexible wire to move. Explain why the field moves. Well, both current carrying conductors have a magnetic field around them. And what's going to happen is the two fields interact, causing the two wires to attract one another. Uh, so that's the direction of movement for the flexible wire. It's going to move towards the thick, rigid wire. And the reason they attract is if you draw a diagram for this and look at the, where the two fields overlap, they're going to cancel out in the region between them. Um, so we're going to get a field, of, a region of weak magnetic field density, and so we're going to get a force pulling them together. So the battery is replaced by one that delivers a smaller current. State the effect this will have on the force acting on the flexible wire. So the force would get smaller. Smaller current means weaker magnetic field gives you a weaker magnetic force when it interacts with something else. Um, yeah. So electromagnetic induction may be demonstrated using a magnet, a solenoid, and other necessary apparatus. State what is meant by electromagnetic induction. So when a magnetic field cuts through a conductor, causing an EMF to be induced, that's electromagnetic induction. So uh, we already actually saw this, so I've just pulled the same diagram off. Um, so we've got a solenoid, galvanometer, connected together, moving a permanent magnet in and out of them. Describe how it use, you would use the apparatus to demonstrate electromagnetic induction. So I'd move the magnet into the coil with a galvanometer con to connect it to it. And we'd get, if we are in inducing an EMF, we would get a deflection in the galvanometer. So we can make the larger EMF by moving the magnets faster. We could use a stronger permanent magnet, or we can increase the number of turns on the coil. Any two of those three would be absolutely fine here. So we've got a block diagram of an electrical energy supply system using the output of a coal-fired power station. Okay, so we've got a, the power station outputs at 1100 volts. That's stepped up to 32,000 to make the current really small, so we have really low energy losses. And then that's stepped back down to 240 for the consumer. So just one possible way of storing surplus energy when the demand from the consumer falls below the output of a power station. Um, so you could, what quite often happens is they pump water upwards behind a dam, so they're essentially reversing the hydroelectric process. But I guess we could also charge batteries, although that's not really what they do. I guess that would work. And one of the ways they're looking forward in the future to doing this is actually using superconductors as a way of storing it as well. Uh, but that's not currently done, so I'm not going to put it here. Statewide electrical energy is transmitted at high voltage. Well, actually, the high voltage isn't important at all. The only reason we use high voltage is that this is low current, and low current reduces power loss. Uh, because of the equation I'm about to show you, P equals I squared R. Low current means low energy loss in your conductor. So a step-up transformer has 1,200 turns. 
on the primary coil. Use the values in the diagram to calculate the number of turns on the secondary, you assuming no losses. So the voltage ratio, it goes from 1100 to 32,000. So it's about 29. So the secondary turns is going to be that number times the number on the primary side. So you can see it's going to be 35,000 turns. So the input to the setback transformer is 800 kilowatts. Calculate the current in the transmission cables, assuming 100% efficiency. So we know P equals IV, so power input equals power output. So we know the power output is going to be 800 kilowatts. We know the output voltage, 32,000. So we can see that the output current is going to be 25 amps. And that completes this set of questions on all things magnetic fields.